All right. So again, I'm doing something a little bit different. It's going to be a little bit more of a Bible study tonight, Judges chapter 6. It's a great story, the story of Gideon. And this goes in, in chapter 6 and chapter 7. We're going to be looking at both chapters. Um, but I think this, this fits in well with a lot of stuff that's going on. And just understanding that, you know, as a Christian, we're in a spiritual warfare. Gideon had a warfare to fight. And there's a lot of great truths and a lot of great symbolism. There's a lot of great teachings from this story of Gideon that we're going to be able to apply to our lives today. And there's, there's a lot of great things that the Lord did with this one man, Gideon. And, you know, the whole book of Judges is just super exciting. I, mean, I, don't, I don't know how you could say that the Bible's dull or boring or anything like that. You read through the book of Judges, man, there's all kinds of stuff going on. It is a great time period where, you know, going back and forth, the children of Israel, you know, getting into idols and stuff. And then there's a, a judge is sent and, and a prophet and a deliverer and people come, you know, and they're ruling and reigning over Israel. And then they go back, you know, it's just flip-flocking back, back and forth. And uh, we're at a time here in Judges 6 where the Midianites... Just another people, another heathen land where it was, was oppressing the children of Israel. And they were coming against them. It says in verse 4 here, look down at the chapter in verse 4. Uh, and they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou come unto Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. For they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude. For both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. So they're being oppressed. I mean, these Midianites just come in. It's like a swarm of grasshoppers. I mean, they come in. They're just innumerable. And the, the, the children of Israel are just feeling helpless because there's so many of them. And they just come right in. They eat all their food. They take their cattle. They take whatever it is that they want. And they basically are just leaving the land desolate behind them. And Israel's crying unto God at this point, you know, and asking God for help. Which, by the way, is the right thing to do. That's the right response. So God answers their cry by sending a prophet. And this prophet's not Gideon. He, he, he starts off by answering them. Look at verse number 8. It says that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you and drave them out from before you and gave you their land. Of course, he's giving them a little history lesson. Say, look, I'm the Lord. I brought you forth out of Egypt when you were being oppressed by the Egyptians. I took you forth out of them. But look at verse number 10. It says, and I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. So they, they get in trouble. They call out to God. What does God do? He sends a prophet and he rebukes them. Because at this point, when the Midianites are devouring all their stuff, they had turned their back on God. They had started worshiping these other gods. They started worshiping the false gods of the people of the land that were round about them. Now all of a sudden, hard times come on them and they're saying, God, God, help us. And God's saying, look, I helped you when I brought you out of Egypt with a strong arm. I mean, all the miracles that you had, you had ample evidence to know that I am the Lord your God. You have plenty to know that, that I am the true Lord. There's no one else but me. I gave you the commandments. You know, Moses gave them all the commandments. They knew what they're supposed to do. And he says, you have not obeyed my voice. And now you're wondering why all of this has come upon you. We can learn from this. Bad things were happening to the children of Israel back then, but they did the right thing by seeking God. That's always the right thing to do. No matter what's going on in your life, you should always have the reaction when, when bad things are happening. Hey, turn to God. Go to God first with the problems that you're having. Always seek Him. Now, God rebuked them because they basically had brought the problems upon themselves. You know, the prophet was sent, and they're saying, look, you know, God told you about this stuff. He told you not to get involved in, in, the, in these false gods and these idols. But as we see from this chapter, God still sends help. Right. He gives them the good rebuking because they needed a good rebuking. He needed to be told, hey, you guys were wrong. 
you, you brought this upon yourself, but God says, okay, nonetheless, I'm still going to, I'm still going to supply some help. I'm still going to bring you what you need because their cry was great upon them. And, and the, you know, what was, what was being done to them? God said, okay, I'll help you out. So don't get discouraged. Maybe you're in the middle of a mess and you have brought it upon yourself and you're full aware of it, right? Because that happens. And look, it'll, it'll happen to you. First of all, don't be so proud as to think that you do nothing wrong. And, you know, the first thing I do when, when I just find myself in the middle of a big mess, because it happens from time to time, the first thing I'm doing is saying, what did I do? And, you know, we ought to have that type of a humble reaction. Say, what did I do? Right. Instead of thinking, why me? Right? Because right? you, know, you have this attitude, oh, why me? I don't know why all this stuff happens. And then you can start blaming God. You start blaming everyone else around you. And the first person you should be looking at is yourself. Now, when bad things happen, it's not always because of something you did. You know, Job didn't have all the bad things happen to him because of anything he did. Satan was attacking him. So I'm not saying you're always at fault, but you know what? That's the first place to start. Always look at yourself and say, what did I do? You know, what, what am I not doing right here? And then don't get discouraged if you have this mess and, you know, you're reading the Bible, you're going to church and you hear the rebuke coming down on something that you've done. You know, we need to have that humble heart to be able to accept that, to hear the rebuke and to still not get bitter against God, not, not hate his word for it, but just be able to accept it and be ready for that rebuke. But we can also still trust that God will hear you and help you as a loving father. I mean, anyone who's born again, God's your father Amen. and you're his son. And just like I mentioned this morning about the prodigal son, you know, the father wanted the son to come back. He went off and, and got into sin. He got into the riotous living. He got into all the stuff he shouldn't have been doing. He brought the mess upon himself when he was, when he was brought low in the, in the pigsty, wanting to eat the food that he was feeding to the pigs. I mean, that's pretty low. But he brought that mess on himself. No, he deserved everything that he got. But nonetheless, what happened? He came back. His father was still looking out for him. And he was welcome home. And it was a big celebration. Hey, he was lost. Now he's found. He's come back home. This is a joyous occasion. And if you bring a big mess upon your head, you get yourself, you know, you might have to face a little bit of a rebuke to understand, yeah, you did wrong. But God's still going to be wanting you to come back and to get right with him and ultimately to keep moving forward. You never want to be defeated in this lifetime. And Gideon is a great example of that, of, of someone who was not defeated and against all odds was able to have faith and trust in God and do the work that God had laid out for him. But let's, uh, let's continue here in this story because not only did he send the prophet, now he goes and sends an angel of the Lord to Gideon. To, to prepare Gideon for the work that he's about to do. Because Gideon is going to be the deliverer. He's going to be the answer to the prayer. To all this oppression that the children of Israel are facing. And they're crying out to God. Gideon is, is being sent as the solution to their problem. As, as the figurehead, as the man to, to bring the power of God. And to deliver the children of Israel out of this oppression. Look at verse number 14. It says, And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites, have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. Don't ever get discouraged into thinking that you're only one person. God, or, or, or think that, you know, God doesn't do miracles anymore. Because that was what Gideon said. Gideon was like, you know, you said you're going to save us. What, I heard from my fathers that you did all these miracles and all this other stuff, but now all we're doing is getting oppressed. He's like, where is, where is all these miracles? Where are all these great things? I thought you were for us, God. We ought not to have that attitude. God can do a lot with one person. And, you know, obviously there's, there's, you're not going to save the whole world. But God can do a lot with one man. And he's often looking for that one man. And especially in the dark world that we live in today, we need some men to stand up. We need some people to, to raise up their voices like a trumpet and thunder out, thus saith the Lord. We need more direction guiding us back into the light. Because too many men have, have cowered down and, and have gotten scared and afraid at the oppression of the wicked. 
The Bible says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. In Philippians 4, a very famous verse. I believe that God is always looking for someone to stand for him. Keep your finger here in Judges 6. Flip over to Ezekiel chapter 22. Ezekiel chapter 22. Of course, you've got the, uh, the book of Psalms right in the dead center of your Bible. And you've got Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and you've got the major prophets, and Ezekiel. It's the last of the major prophets. Ezekiel chapter 22. We're going to see what I believe is a description very similar to what we have going on in, in, even in our own country today. In Ezekiel 22, verse number 24, verse 23, the Bible reads, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto her, Thou art the land that is not cleansed nor rained upon in the day of indignation. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion ravening the prey. They have devoured souls. They have taken the treasure and precious things. They have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Her priests have violated my law and have profaned mine holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and profane. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean and have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths and I am profaned among them. He's saying, look, this is what's happening in the land. There's a conspiracy of their prophets. Why? Because they're, they're prophesying for money, for filthy lucre's sake. They don't want to preach the right things. He's saying they violated his law and they're not even able to give you the difference between the unclean and the clean. This is the preacher that won't stand up and call sin a sin and say, this is unclean. Stay away from this. This is clean. This is good. This is right. And they start muddying the waters and basically nothing's that big of a deal. You know, they preach a, a, a cool hell, a fine sin, you know, that, that nothing's a big deal instead of thundering out what they ought to be saying from God's law. And that's what's going on today, by the way. You want to talk about profane. You want to talk about filthy. Any man of God that can't stand up and say that the sodomites are vile and filthy and perverted and disgusting. If you can't make that stand, then you, well, how are you could possibly make the difference between clean and unclean? Right. And this is what's happening today. Because people are afraid. They're afraid of the backlash. They're afraid of what's politically correct. They're afraid of, of people leaving their church. They're afraid of, oh, what's going to happen if I actually call this out? Keep reading here, verse 27. Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening the prey to shed blood and to destroy souls to get dishonest gain. And her prophets have daubed them with untempered mortar, seeing vanity and divining lies unto them, saying, Thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord hath not spoken. That's a false prophet saying, Oh yeah, God said this, God said that, when God didn't say any of those things. Verse 29, The people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and needy. Yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. Verse 30, And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none. Therefore have I poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord God. He's describing this land, the land where the priests and the prophets are profane. They're not able to, to preach the way that he wants them to preach. They're saying, making up all this stuff out of their own heart that God didn't say. They're not preaching what's true and right. And God's saying, you know what? All this stuff is going on here. They're oppressing the poor. There's, you know, the widows aren't being taken care of. And he's like, I sought for a man. He didn't see, seek out, you know, a, a company, an army. He sought for a man. He's like, I was just looking for one person. In this whole land, I'm looking for one person that's willing to stand up and say, Thus saith the Lord. Didn't find him. Where is that man? He's saying, you know, I, I didn't want to destroy the land. But where is that man that's willing to stand up? 
Therefore, because I couldn't find them, I had to bring my judgment up. I had to pour out my indignation upon them. I recompense upon their heads, saith the Lord God. See, God is always looking for that one man to stand up, to stand in head, to make up the gap. Amen. And we need more men like that to stand up today. Amen. To say, you know what? There's this apostasy going on all around us. There's people... I, have, I literally... Because I've been facing this flag, and if, you don't, if you're not aware of what's going on, we stand, the Word of Truth Better stands with Verity Baptist Church, who has been in the news lately for the comments made about the sodomites that were killed in Orlando. I agree 100% with the comments that were made. And because of that, we get a little bit of flack. We get people hating on us. I had someone this week who claimed to be an independent, fundamental, Baptist preacher comment on our, on our Facebook page, right? And saying how wrong we are and all this other stuff. He had the nerve. He had the nerve to list. He's saying, oh, you think homosexuals should be put to death. Well, that's just as ridiculous as putting to death someone who commits adultery or someone whose ox had killed someone else in time past and you didn't keep them in. And he starts listing God's laws in Leviticus and he called them ridiculous. I don't know about you, but I believe that the law of the Lord is perfect. Amen. Now, we may not have all of his laws in place today. We have very few, it seems, these days. But when you could ridicule, when you call something ridiculous, you're ridiculing what the Bible says. That's the argument that I hear from the atheist. That's the argument that I hear from the people that hate God, that want to mock the Bible. And God say, oh, someone, you know, the child who, who smites his parent should be put to death. Amen and amen. If God said that something like that deserves a death penalty, who am I to judge God and say, no, God, that's not a just judgment. That's not a just punishment. A man claiming to be an independent... I mean, look, the world will say that. The atheists will say that. And that's fine. I expect that from them. I don't expect them to, to revere God's law as being something that's true and pure and, and, and just. But when someone calling, claiming to be an IFB preacher, mocking the word of God, God, help us. What is the state of our society when that's the case? When you're going to call out as, as being ridiculous God's law. And look, I don't know. If you don't stand, you know, if, you don't, if you don't believe, and I've said this in the past, if you don't believe that sodomites should be put to death today, whatever. You know what? You don't, I don't care whether you believe that or not. I believe that they should. I believe just like adulterers should be put to death today. I believe that should be the law. I think that should be the law of the land. I think that people who kidnap should be put to death. I think that, you know, you go through those laws. I do believe that they're legitimate. Okay? But, you know, if you disagree, whatever, but don't call God's laws ridiculous. Don't, don't call out the law of the Lord and say, Oh, you know, then we'd be putting everyone. It's like, no, we wouldn't be putting everyone to death. If, if we would be putting everybody to death today, what about when the laws actually existed and were in place? Was everybody just put to death? No, because the Bible says that when people see this type of judgment, they will hear and fear and not do those things. There is great preventative measures when you have such punishments on these crimes that God deems to be a capital offense. When people hear about that, they say, whoa, I'm not going to do that. Just like the false accuser facing whatever it is they get found out for lying about, they need to face the same exact punishment of whoever it was they're trying to get in trouble that they would have faced. You lie about someone committing a murder, guess what? Now the liar is going to be put into death. That's the law of the Lord, my friend, and, and, and his judgment is perfect, and I believe that. But this is, this is the state we're in today. And I think God's looking for men to stand up and say, no, I actually believe the Bible. I actually am going to stand up for it. I'm not going to be embarrassed. I'm not going to be ashamed. You bring up any example that you want out of this book, and I will stand on it 100%. You won't get me to back down. I'm not going to be embarrassed. Oh, yeah, well, that was in this Old Testament. But, you know, God, you know, look, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Jesus Christ is the Word of God. Amen. God doesn't change. 
God's attitude on this morally repugnant behavior has not changed. Let's flip back, if you would, to Judges chapter 6. God chose Gideon to work a great work. And the work that he chose him to do wasn't popular, by the way. Obviously, it's not popular to be fighting against the Midianites when the Midianites are oppressing you and they're like the sand by the seashore when their innumerable host is coming upon you. It's definitely not going to be popular with the Midianites who have the oppression, but even his own people, because he had to stand against the Midianites, which far outnumbered them, who were oppressing him, but he also had to go against his own people's false religion that his own father had set up. He had to, God had told him before he even went and delivered the children of Israel out of the hand of Midian, the first thing he did, he was called to tear down the altar of Baal. The Satan worship, the idolatry that was going on inside of Israel. God said, we got to get rid of this first. This is the, is, is the real problem. This is the source. Taking care of the Midianites? God's like, that's not a big deal. We'll take care of that. Let's get right with God first. Let's, let's get the false gospel, the false preaching, the false gods out of here. Look at verse number 25 of chapter 6. By the reason, it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath, and cut down the grove that is by it, and build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock in the ordered place, and take the second bullock, and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove, which thou shalt cut down. Now we're starting to see churches these days, I believe there's a small movement growing that are, pop, that, are, that are coming up and they're throwing down these altars of Baal. And they're saying, well, you know, we need to get rid of this. We're, we don't need to stray off in, into, this, um, into these places. Because that's what, you know, the children of Israel did that. They allowed the influence of the false gods to get in and contaminate their pure religion. And before you know it, they're building up altars unto Baal instead of altars unto the Lord. And God's saying, you know what, we've got to wipe the slate clean, get rid of this, stamp it out, take the, the altars down, cut down the grove, because God said he didn't want to make in groves either, because that's how the, the, the heathen worshipped their false gods. And he's like, you build an altar unto me, and you're going to make a sacrifice, and you, the wood you're going to use is from the grove that you tear down. But see, this movement we've got growing today is a movement that's sick of all the hypocrisy in the churches, that's sick of all the compromising, that's sick of all going the way of the world that seems to be infecting the so-called Christianity today. And it takes someone willing to face the opposition and not back down and to stand firmly on God's word. It takes courage. Just like it took the courage of Gideon to do the things that he did. It wasn't popular. All the people, look, they went out to kill Gideon after he tore down the, the, the altar of Baal. He, had to, he did it at night because he's like, I don't even know what's going to happen if I do this in the daytime. He went out at night. He pulled down. He did exactly what God told him to do. He pulled it down. He set up the altar unto the Lord saying, nope, we're going to worship God. We're going to worship the Lord. Get this satanic garbage out of here. But that caused them to come after Gideon to try to kill him. Verse 30, Then the men of the city said unto Joash, Bring out thy son that he may die, because he hath cast down the altar of Baal, and because he hath cut down the grove that was by him. And even though the people wanted Gideon dead, he was delivered. He didn't end up dying. They didn't end up getting him. Now, it must have been kind of scary for him. It must have been a, you know, a, a, a trial, a tribulation, you know, facing that. Like, oh man, what are these people going to do? God delivered him out of them through the words of his own father. His father's the one that says, you know what? Why don't you let Baal, you know, Baal's this so-called God. Why don't you let him speak for himself? You know, I mean, if this is such a great sin that he did, why doesn't Baal come over here and, and kill him then? You know, and that was a, the reason that he used. He ended up um, getting Gideon's life spared. But that was what was required first. Now, any time you're facing this type of opposition, any time you're going up against the false religion or, or the, the, you know, the, the altar of Baal that needs to be torn down that people have just grown really accustomed to, 
You're going to have people that hate you and want to kill you. I mean, that's what they did with Jesus Christ. He came in at a time when there was great apostasy in, in the Judaism religion. When you had the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they were both wrong. They both had it completely wrong, and they were trusting in their works. They were trusting what they thought was in the law and completely missed the boat on salvation by grace through faith, which is the way that it always has been. We saw that in Romans 4 this morning. And, and, you know, Jesus was throwing down their altars, figuratively. He was preaching against it, and they wanted to kill him the same way that they wanted to kill Gideon here. And any time you're willing to stand up, be bold, and make the stand, and say, we're done with this garbage, we're done with this nonsense, and cast it down, be ex expect to face the same type of opposition. Now, after he tears down the altar of Baal, now Gideon is calling on the children of Israel to go up with him to fight against Midian. So he, he sends out messages unto, to various tribes of Israel saying, come on, you know, come with me, help me to face this battle. Now, keep in mind, it's a huge battle that he's facing. He just had this victory by tearing down the altar of Baal, but now he's facing the Midianites. It says in um, chapter 7 of Judges, in verse number 12, And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east lay along in the valley like grasshoppers for multitude, and their camels were without number as the sand by the sea for mul seaside for multitude. Huge opposition. <laughs> And look at who, who he ends up getting. And look, in verse number 2 of, of chapter 7, we're going to start looking in Judges 7 now. That's the force that Gideon is facing. That's the force that he's saying, okay, we're going to go fight these Midianites now. And it's just, I mean, you're looking at a sea of people, right? And this is back when, you know, in combat when you would go and physically fight against the enemy with your swords, with well, whatever weapons you had to go out and do that type of a battle. And um, look what God tells Gideon now in verse number two of Judges 7. And the Lord said unto Gideon, the people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. Now therefore go, go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from the Mount Gilead. And there returned of the people 20 and 2,000, and there remained 10,000. So keep this all in mind, because this is what Gideon's facing. He had 32,000 men facing an innumerable battle. I mean, 32,000 verses. And when I, in Judges 8, it talks about 120,000 men being killed. So well over 132,000 versus over 120,000. And then they had 15,000 remaining. So like 135,000 versus 32,000. And God says, yeah, that's too many. <laughs> I was like, uh, okay. <laughs> so he says, okay, here's what you need to do. Anyone that's fearful, he says, tell them to go home. We don't want you here. If you're afraid to go to this battle, he said, go on and get out of here. He does that and he loses 20,000 men. Or 20 and 2,000. And it says, and there remain 10,000. So now he's just left with, with, a, with a, a company of 10,000 men. To fight over a hundred thousand. Huge odds stacked against him. And of course, we know the story, it's still too many for God. God's like, yeah, you know, 10,000, that's still too much. Because God's saying, you know what, I want you to understand, I want you to make known that this battle, the victory is only coming by me. It's not because you're great warriors. It's not because you have this, this, this better intellect, because you're, you're better at the battle than they are, because you're so much stronger. He said, nope, the only reason you're going to win this battle is because I'm with you. God gets all the credit for this, and that's why he, he whittles it down. And, um, you know, he basically brings them to water, and, and, you know, depending on how they drink the water, whether they, they get down on their hands and knees or whether they bring the water to their mouth, is, how, is the way that he uses to whittle down the number. And it says in verse 7, And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the 300 men that lapped will I save you, and deliver the Midianites into thine, into thine hand, and let all the other people go, uh, go every man unto his place. 
He was told to fight this battle with only 300 people. 300 versus 135,000. Talk about the odds being stacked against you. This battle, to involve yourself and engage in this type of a battle, requires faith. It requires boldness. Gideon cannot waver in this battle. He cannot be unstable. He cannot be thinking like, oh man, we've only got 300 people. He needs to have the boldness and the strength and the faith in God to say, you know what? God said it. I believe it. I'm going out there and doing this. And he's done. I mean, give Gideon the credit where it's due. Everything that God has told him to do, he's done it. Every single thing along the way. We see nothing here to show that Gideon is not going to do anything that God's telling him to do. The battle that we face today, the opposition's against us. And it's going to be against us, you know, until Christ comes back. But that doesn't matter. We need to still get in the fight, not be afraid of the opposition, not get scared when, when, when the enemy shows his face, and be able to stand up and not waver and have the faith that, you know, if God be for us, who can be against us? Gideon is not back down, but he is a little scared. And we get a little insight into this, and I think anyone here could probably understand why he's got a little bit of fear in him. You know, no matter how much, it's easy to stand up here behind the pulpit today and say, yeah, you know, we've got to have this faith and the courage and everything else. But when you're among 300 men and you're facing 100, you know, 132,000, 150,000 men, you know, it's, it's, that's real. That's when it gets real. Right. And Gideon was a little bit scared. But you know what? God helped him out with that too. God understands our heart. God understands our human condition. And God goes to Gideon in verse number 9 here of chapter 7. It says, And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Arise, get thee down unto the host, for I have delivered it into thine hand. But if thou fear to go down, go thou with Phira thy servant down to the host. And thou shalt hear what they say, and afterward shall thine hands be strengthened to go down unto the host. Then went he down with Fura's servant unto the outside of the armed men that were in the host. And then he hears them, you know, they talk about this dream that he had, and, and they, they reveal the interpretation of the dream that, that basically God delivers the whole host of Midian into the, into the hands of Gideon. And, um, you know, it's interesting that God tells them, he said, look, I've already secured the battle for you, but if you're fearful, you know, just go, go on down there and just listen to what they say. So the very next thing, it's Gideon's down there listening to what they say. You know, it's, it's that, that, that human nature, that fear. is like, okay, God, well, I'm going to go and listen to what he said. So he hears that he gets the comfort and he gets the strength. But you know what? I thank God that we have this and many other stories from the Bible. See, back in the days of the judges with Gideon, they didn't even have very much scripture to, to, to have as that comfort and that edification from God. We've got the whole Bible. Praise God for that. We have these stories. We have the stories like Gideon and many others that are recorded that we could gain our strength from. So that when we face a battle that seems to just be opposing us and man, there's no way we could ever possibly win this. We could think back and say, look at what Gideon did. Look at what David did when he faced Goliath. Look at what any other great, valiant fight was that, that God just delivered him. The, the children of Israel coming out of Moses. When we face our battles, we can see what God has already done and know exactly what he's capable of doing. Look at verse number 16 of Judges chapter 7. Because now this is his plan with the 300 men. What he does to, to defeat the, the huge army. Verse 16, And he divided the 300 men into three companies, and he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. And he said unto them, Look on me and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall ye do. When I blow with a trumpet, I and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of all the camp, and say, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came unto the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch. And they had but newly set the watch. And they blew the trumpets and brake the pitchers that were in their hands. And the three companies blew the trumpets and brake the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hands 
and the trumpets in their right hands to blow with them. And they cried, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they stood, every man in his place, round about the camp, and all the host ran and cried and fled. They never even had to pick up a weapon. You know, in one hand they had the lamps, the other hand they had the trumpet of the 300 men. They never even had to pick up their weapon at this point to, to, to bring that great victory. Now we know they do end up slaying them and killing them and fighting them and, you know, and, and Israel gets gathered out together after them. But this is the point. Now I want to look at a few instances here in this small passage on how the victory was achieved and how we could apply what happened here and the, the method that he used to our own life. First of all, it started with preparation. The, the victory that Gideon achieved starts with preparation, calling unto God and getting right with him first. Right? He's faced with this big dilemma. He's faced with this great challenge, this great problem. The first thing he does, they call unto God, the children of Israel, and they get right with him first by casting down that altar bail, getting that sin out. Then he seeks out the soldiers that are not afraid. The ones that are willing to stand up. The ones that are called by God to the battle. And he didn't rely on his own wisdom. He trusted that God was able to save even by few. Your own wisdom is going to say, God, I'm not getting rid of these people. Are you crazy? Look at how many they have. Nope. R rely on what God said. And that's exactly what he did. And then when you get to the point here where they have the lights, they're hidden, right, in the, in the pictures. Because, they, you know, it's a surprise thing. So they're, 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 they're breaking everything open. They're sounding the trumpet. And they're, they're, make, they're giving the impression like there's this huge army surrounding them and that, you know, they just caught them unaware and that they're going to just go in and destroy them. And it caused a great confusion. But what I see out of this, when they, when they let their light shine, had a lot of power when they would not let their light be hid under a bushel. As Jesus said in Matthew 5, 14, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The people, the 300 the, that weren't afraid, that were willing to do the, the work that God has laid out for them, they let that light shine. They let that light shine bright. They, they, they broke the, the, the picture that was covering it and let it shine for all the world to see. In the middle of the darkness, in the middle of the night, that light needs to shine. And we need to let our lights shine. You have a light inside of you. You have the light of Jesus Christ and the light of the truth of the gospel and of the, of the word of God needs to shine forth out of every single one of us individually. The world is dark and it's only getting darker. We need to make sure that our lights are shining. And not only did they break open their pitchers and let that light shine, they also sounded the trumpet. They proclaimed loudly the righteousness of the Lord. Isaiah 58 1 says, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression in the house of Jacob their sins. The victory was wrought from the preparation, from the soldiers that were not afraid um, to go out to battle for God, not relying on their own wisdom, by letting their light shine, and by sounding out the trumpet. Having that boldness and the courage to just let it shine forth. And they used the best weapon. What did they say? The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. God is the one that gets the credit for the victory. As I mentioned, just like David, Goliath, just like Moses with Pharaoh. God is looking for men that will stand in the gap today. Look at what he did with just one, per one person. I mean, Gideon goes on then to, 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 to judge Israel after this. I mean, they were being oppressed mightily. The wicked men of that land were, were completely had the, the, the mastery over them. They were in bondage. And through using one man, he completely turned everything on its head. 
completely. I mean, I mean, the, the, the whole force and every, you know, everything changed. All the forces changed. The people who were in power no longer were in power. Now all of a sudden the children of Israel are, are freed from the bondage of the Midianites. Are you willing to be used like Gideon? You've got to ask yourself that. Am I willing to stand in the gap like Gideon did? It's not going to be easy. You're going to face a lot of opposition. It's going to require a lot of courage. It's going to require a lot of faith in God's word. You've got to be ready not to back down. You've got to be ready for people to be willing to want to kill you, for people to be coming out against you. You've got to be willing to cast down the altar of Baal. Say, I don't care how long we've had this, tra this vain tradition going on. If it's against the word of the Lord, then it needs to go. Gideon's own father is the one that built that altar. You know, you may have to be fighting against your own family. But if it's the right fight and the right battle that the Lord has set out, you need to be able to do it. You need to have the courage to break that vessel that's hiding your light. So you don't just keep it kid, hid, but you, you let it shine for all to see. And you need to have that voice to sound like a trumpet. The, that perfect law of the Lord. We need Gideon and his 300 men today. We need David to face the giant. We need more people to stand up and say, Here am I, Lord, send me. And God made that promise with the children of Israel. And this, this, this brought to mind this verse in Leviticus 26. He says, you know, if you keep my statutes, if you keep my commandments, if you do what's right, he, sell, he tells them all the blessings they're going to have in the land. He says, you know, I'm going to bless the land. You'll be in peace. You'll be in safety. And he says, and you shall chase your enemies and they shall fall before you by the sword. And five of you shall chase an hundred and an hundred of you shall put 10,000 to flight. That was a promise of God if they would just keep his words. And you know what? The Bible says that safety is of the Lord. If we can just trust in God and, and have faith in his, in his word and his commandments and don't, you know, don't let this world shake you up and rattle you and shake your faith or get you scared or, or try to hide that light. Have faith in God. Even when you feel like you're alone. Like Elijah felt alone. But he wasn't alone. We have so many stories from this book to give you the strength that you need. Get in this book and learn them and know those stories. To have that courage. A lot of these men had to go through it with way less than what we have. Unto whom much is given, so shall much be required. God requires a lot of this generation. I believe God requires way more of us today than he ever did of Gideon. We've got the story of Gideon. We've got the story of Elijah. We've got the stories of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We have the story of Daniel. We have the story of these great men of God that didn't fold, that didn't falter, that stood on the word of the Lord. We have those stories. We know what God's capable of. He's capable of a lot. And you know what? Don't say that God's power is any more diminished today than it was back then. The same God has the same powers to perform miracles today just as he did back then. But he's looking for the man to stand in the gap. Will you be that person? Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for these great stories that could edify us and comfort us, dear Lord, and help us to stand strong in the day of battle. Lord, we are fighting a, not a physical battle, but a spiritual battle, Lord. There's one going on daily. And uh, the, the forces of darkness are continually trying to silence the, the forces of good and, and the light that we have that you've given to us through our Lord Jesus Christ, dear God. I pray that you please help us never to be ashamed of that light, but to let it shine, Lord, to do the work that you've laid out for us to do. God, I'm fully faithful that you can do a lot. And, and we're standing up here. The people of our church are standing up, dear Lord, to stand up for what's right, to not be um, altered or changed by the, the, the perverted culture that we have today, dear Lord, but to defend your word and to preach it from the housetops, Lord. The things that you've told us in our ears, we're going we're gonna to preach them from the housetops, dear God. And uh, we pray that you would please just use us uh, according to your will and, and, and light the path for us so that we know the right way that we need to go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.